the younger generation, the generation that are, you know, going for education at the minute, are a fantastic generation of young people who generally on the whole are extremely, you know, accepting of all gender identities and that yes, they may not understand it all the time, but actually mm-hmm. we are seeing more people breaking down that binary and, you know, refusing to conform to it and also refusing to accept that that is, you know, the only case, even if they don't identify as gender non-conforming. Hello and welcome to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. We get curious about all things gender, sex and sexuality, as well as relationships, feminism, the inclusive kind, mental health and kink, and all that makes us humans unique and diverse. From body positivity to body dysmorphia, it's all welcome here. If you like what we do and want to make a contribution, you can become a patron on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender, or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. Now join us on a journey of inclusion, acceptance and respect. I'm your host, Esther Lemons. I am a cis queer woman and my pronouns are she and her. In this episode, I have a conversation with geography teacher Jacob Prophet. Jacob's pronouns are they and them, and they identify as a gay non-binary person. Find out what that means to Jacob in this episode. We also talk about the freedom that comes with going to university, societal conditioning around masculine and feminine binaries, exploring gender identity through drag, being non-binary in education, feeling attracted to male-presenting people as opposed to masculinity, and being inspired by a younger generation. It was recorded on the 14th of September 2021. Now let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome. What's your name? My name is Jacob. Hello, Jacob. Tell me about your gender experience. Uh, My gender identity is gender non-binary. And that's only something that I've really discovered in the last sort of three, four years of my life. And Mm. I've started to explore that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So have you always had an awareness of, you know, gender non-conformity in some way? It wasn't until I went to university that I first became aware of sort of not conforming to the gender binary mm-hmm. and mixing with, you know, different types of queer groups. I, you know, I grew up in a military family and so moved around every few years, didn't have friends for, you know, more than three years at a time. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, went to some small schools, which were very much heteronormative based and, you know, it was very difficult so you couldn't really explore different identities whereas when I went to uni you know I dived straight in with LGBTQ society and you know started going out into like the club scene and stuff like that and met you know a whole variety of people and from there my mind was really opened up Mm, yeah yeah I was just reminded of the episode I did with Kit about higher education like Mm. quite a few of the students said that you know uni was just such an open space like a blank canvas yeah. to re i don't know rediscover or like redefine yourself you know as Definitely. far as identity goes yeah. yeah yeah so what happened a few years ago then when you started embracing the non-binary label so the whole journey into being non-binary started with the idea of you know i was meddling with uh, the art form of drag and it was actually after i left the art form and I just didn't feel like I didn't feel like I was secure in my gender identity at that point. And mm. I felt like it was starting to appear that actually I didn't feel that male as a gender represented who I was as a person. Mm-hmm. And I had conversations with my friends who are, you know, gender non conforming. And I said to them, you know, I'm just, I, this is the way I'm feeling. And they went, well, look at all these different labels. That there are there that you know don't conform to the male female binary, and mm. so by having those conversations with them, I then could sort of look at my own identity and go, well, I actually feel like the categories I fit into is either the gender fluid or gender queer, and then I really settled on the fact that gender non-binary is probably the one that's most suited for what I believe represents my own identity. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. So, how did you actually get into drag? Um, it was very much, it was a bit of an accident. I was watching of the very famous TV show RuPaul's Drag Race and I just went, that looks fun. I kind of want to give it a go. 
and I was going out on the club scenes with uni and I became friends with one of the uh, drag queens that, you know, ran the student night at the, at the, mm. um, at the club. And they were like, yeah, you could, you can get into it. Here's like a list of things that you probably would need to get started. Mm. And I sort of just fell into a little family of people. I was invited to start performing as part of like a little club night. And from there, right, you know, I grew and I was performing weekly and improving like dabbling in makeup and then looking at costuming and stuff like that and, you know, wig styling. And I did that pretty much from the second year of uni and until my final year, which was I did four years. So I did about three years of it. And Mm. it was a little family of us and it was, you know, a whole bunch of different queer people coming together once a week um, or, you know, every few months to, you know, have a party put on mm. you know the glam glamorous dresses and the makeup and all that mm. and yeah so that really is when I that's how I got into it it was almost it wasn't I didn't plan on it I just met the right people at the right time after watching the right tv show and mm-hmm. uh yeah it sort of fell into me it fell into my lap and I loved it mm-hmm. I, at the time it was you know it was everything I looked forward to in my week and when that student loan came in, the first thing I would buy would be the makeup and the wigs and the, you know, the heels. And then I'd be like, oh, I actually need money for food as well. Um, <laughs> priorities. It, right? Yeah, yeah, I had my priorities. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was, yeah. it wasn't, I didn't plan on ever going into it, but I don't regret that it did. It's some of the best experiences I've had. Mm. So how did that influence your gender journey? How did that develop? It allowed me to actually think about my gender because in the society we live in, which, you know, is everyone is straight or cisgender until they say something, mm. it it allowed me to actually have the space to think about it. And I remember, you know, people used to ask me, oh, so if, if you do drag, does that mean you, you know, you want to, you know, transition? And I'm like, no. I used to then be quite adamant and be like, no, I'm, you know, I'm a man. I'm a male. You know, when I take the makeup off, I'm still, you know, a man. And, you know, I think that was almost a block that I had, that I couldn't be anything outside of the binary. And then Mm -hmm. it wasn't until, you know, like I said, when I was, when I quit drag, that actually I realized that I can be more than just that binary. And that even though, yes, I did drag, it's not, it wasn't almost like it, it felt a bit taboo to go from doing drag to then, you know, questioning your gender identity at the time. Whereas now I'm actually like, it was that pathway that helped me unlock it and it actually helped me be more comfortable with it and educated me a lot on it as well. Mm. So you had at the time, would you say, quite a binary idea of gender still until yeah. you discovered this, you know. Yeah, definitely. You know, when I yeah. went to uni, I I hadn't really been around queer people and if I had, it was often, you know, just, you know, the G and the L from the LGBT. It wasn't, you know, I didn't know that many people who weren't on gender conforming or identify as trans as well. Mm-hmm. So until I went to uni and I met those new people when I had those experiences, I was, you know, very binary in my thinking. And then mm-hmm. I look back on it now and, you know, the amount of people I've met and the wealth of knowledge I have, I go, how could I ever think in that way? But at the time, yeah. it was all, it was the only thing I knew. I i hadn't ever been taught anything different. And mm. it was just, it was just what I, I was used to. And I stuck to that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes total sense. You don't know until you know, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so you said um, drag was kind of in the past tense for you. What made you give it up? Was it just being at the end of uni and sort of maybe not losing connection with those people, but it not being the same what happened there yeah so the opportunities changed I was doing it less because I obviously I, in my final year of uni I was focusing on actually getting a good grade in my degree so I did put it on the back burner and then I finished my degree and then I moved I was in Aberdeen for my degree mm-hmm. um, so up in northeast of Scotland and then I moved all the way down to Bristol and the opposite end of the country mm-hmm. Um and, you know, I moved, I had no friends, no support network. And so I thought, well, it feels like it came to a natural end almost. Mm. I left the city where I started doing it and, you know, it just, it came to that natural conclusion and you know, it just felt right at the time. 
that mm-hmm. it would just be something that I left in the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So do you feel that place of non-binary identity, do you feel like that's that's your kind of your home now? Or do you feel like it might change again? Obviously, that's hard to predict, you know, but like, yeah, I just wondered how how set you feel, quote unquote, in yeah. that label. Yeah, I I actually feel pretty pretty set in it. I I have got you know the days where I wake up and I do look at myself and I go, maybe I just wish I was a little bit more feminine. And then I wake up on the days where I'm like, I wish I was a little bit more masculine. But I can't ever imagine myself, you know, declaring myself cisgender again, or mm. you know, wanting to take that next step and maybe transition into a different gender. I feel like non-binary is, I feel pretty stable in my gender identity at the moment. Mm. And I feel pretty secure in that I'm happy and I'm confident in who I am now, which is Mm. not what I, I didn't used to have that. I used to always have those little doubts in my mind that I would squash. Whereas now I can confidently say that, you know, I'm definitely a gender non-conforming individual. Maybe the non-binary label might change to maybe something like gender fluid. But Mm -hmm. at that moment, I still just see myself as, you know, non-binary. And I can imagine that will probably stick for the foreseeable. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You just mentioned um, masculine and feminine. What would you say those mean to you now compared to when you had more of a binary idea of gender? So for me, when I I I think I still do have that little bit of almost what, that binary mindset of what masculine and feminine is. So I still have that idea that, you know, masculines all wearing, you know, suits and the beards and being all manly. Um, It's hard to explain, but it's almost like, you know, you've got that stereotype in your head of what masculine should be. And, you know, when it comes to feminine, it's that whole, you know, you wear the, you know, the nice fancy shoes, you wear the more feminine, you know, blouses and stuff like that. And, and I know in my head that that is not always the case and that, you know, there's masculinity is not just acting manly and acting male. And I think that's still a little bit of a binary notion I have in my own sort of conscious. And Mm. I need to probably, you know, it is something that I'll probably break down over time. And I think that's just because in society still, there's still very much that notion of what makes a man a man and what makes a woman a woman and what's masculine and what's feminine. Um, So, you know, but when it comes to like how I'm feeling is that sometimes I just wish I could put on any old outfit, no matter whether it was, you know, bought in the women's section or bought in the men's section of a shop and just, you know, feel comfortable in it. And I think in my job being a teacher, I wear suits all the time. And I look at it and I go, I just wish I could wear something else. And I love wearing my suits mm. and I feel I feel really nice in my suits. But sometimes I'm just like, oh, I just wish I could put on like a nice like floaty blouse and a nice pair of like high-waisted trousers and just feel, you know, mm. confidence to go out and do that and not have everyone being like, what are they doing? Like And like, you know, giving me all that look as I walk to work and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So what's it like being a non-binary teacher? It's it's interesting. And to be fair, this since September, we've only been back a couple of weeks. This is actually the first year where I've really been open about it. Mm. Um, so I've been teaching sort of, I've done two full years of teaching now. And for those two years, I went by Mr. And everyone referred to me as Sir. And everyone would use he, him pronouns, whereas sort of, about so sort of probably just after about April time last year, I had conversations with my head of department, my um, colleagues in school who I'm friends with, and I said, you know, I've identified as non-binary for a long time, and I sort of almost went back into the closet almost and hid my identity of who I was because I wanted to make my life easier and conform to that system that's in mm. place, that you have your male, female teachers who are sir and miss or missus. And I just went, it's not fair because I'm teaching kids who are confiding in me that they're non-binary, but I can't feel proud of myself to actually be non-binary. And Mm. it actually came about, I had a, I have a wonderful student in my tutor group who came to me 
and they said, I'm non-binary and I want to tell the tutor group. And it made me think and I go, if this young person who is 13 years old can declare that they want to tell the world that they are non-binary, then me as a 25-year-old should be able to do the same. And they said they didn't want to do it that day. But that day I stood up in front of my tutor group and I went, just let you all know a little bit something about myself. I, since I was, you know, 22, I've identified as gender non-binary. And going forward, if you can try and use my pronouns with they, them, that would be preferred. And I think it was really important because actually it made me feel very proud of myself. But then I knew that it gave that person a space to feel more safe in, in themselves at school as well. And that there was, you know, an adult who they knew who also identified as gender non-binary. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that. So you just mentioned you started using they, them pronouns. And I just wondered what language do you use? I mean, do you say I am a non-binary person or you identify as? Yeah, I typically say to my students, I identify as a non-binary person. But the language of it, it's, it sounds bad to, to say, but I don't think too much about the language of it, about how I say it, because mm -hmm. I think as I like to just make sure I say it clearly and that when I'm in a room full of 30 students and I'm telling them about who I am, that they all understand in simple mm -hmm. terms. So, you know, my youngest years, so like my year sevens who are 11, 12 years old, who have just started in secondary school. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I explain to them very clearly, I identify as gender non-binary. This means I don't identify as the male gender or as the female gender. I'm sort of in, I always say the wibbly wobbly gray bit in the middle, where, <laughs> um, which obviously is a very scientifically accurate term. It um, totally is, yeah. But I, you know, I explain it to them in them terms because I want them to understand that actually gender is on a spectrum. And mm. I just, you know, I don't fit to the spectrum that they've always, you know, they've always thought it was two points was actually, there's a whole wave that you can be in the middle, uh, mm. you know, and in school, obviously, they can't just call me Jacob. They have to say, you know, obviously it was tradition, it was Mr, but now I go by mix. Mm -hmm. So the gender neutral term, and that's something that I've introduced new this year. And, you know, instead of sir, it's teacher. So, mm. you know, it's teaching them a little bit about language to use that's maybe appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't worry about what language I do use to describe myself, but I worry about the language that I teach them because mm. I want to make sure that what I'm teaching them is appropriate and also respectful to others, but also ways that they can, if they do meet non-binary people outside of education, you know, in like 10 years time after they've left school, then they have ways in which they, they know that they can address them without, you know, causing offense or upset and actually have mm. the confidence to have those conversations as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Is there something you would like to talk about and mention that we haven't done yet? I think the important thing that I'd like to talk about is for anyone who, you know, is maybe listening and works in education or works with young people and doesn't identify as, you know, gender non-conforming, it's a scary step to take to open up about yourself, but it's mm. actually so important as well. I run a pride group at school and when I was at school, I could never have imagined, you know, having a pride group run by, a, you know, an openly queer teacher at school. And mm. so to have a pride group and I, you know, I'm getting about 50, 60 kids, you know, across a couple of lunch times a week. So it shows it's needed. Wow, and yeah. I have kids who are gender non-conforming. I have kids who want to transition to the opposite gender. I have uh, students who are secure that they are cisgender, but they want to learn more about the whole spectrum that gender identity is. Mm. And I think it's been really important as my role to almost be that representation in school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't teach in a city. I teach in the only school in a, a relatively small town in Somerset. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's a, a mixing pot of cultures. Yeah. So 
by me coming out and you know openly talking about being non-binary it's educating 1000 kids in that school about what non-binary identity is Mm. and that it's a valid identity and that it's in their community and it's in every community you know around the world and actually we're in a place where I feel comfortable to talk about it and I think Mm. any person who works with young people it's important to have those conversations because young people learn by seeing that representation and they will you know it will normalize that behavior almost or normalize that identity mm-hmm. and i think that's one of the really important things is because you know there's a lot of debate that happens about at the minute a lot of discourse around gender identity in the media you know people saying that that identity isn't valid to be non-gender conforming mm-hmm. whereas actually by normalizing that identity it shows it is val- valid and mm. it is perfectly acceptable to not conform to society standards of binary gender mm, totally yeah do you ever come across any issues with maybe like parents or carers or anything like that how do you approach subjects like that i'm i'm, I'm lucky that i haven't but i'm you know i'm not going to be delusional and say it's never going to happen it's an issue that I imagine will crop up. There are definitely some parents in the school who I know probably do have things that they probably might say about me. I'm lucky that the leadership team in my school is extremely supportive mm-hmm. and that, you know, if they ever got anything about it, they would disregard it because they would support me 100% in my identity. And I think that's really important is that I know I've got the back of my school. But in the last few years you've seen debates of you know you've seen protests outside schools you know like the school protests in Birmingham where they were talking about LGBTQIA plus issues in a primary mm-hmm. school and parents protested outside of that school for months um, wow. attacking organizations and so I know that in some areas if I was to go teach there I probably would be met with discourse for mm-hmm. my identity and I probably would face issues with parents and carers And then Mm -hmm. that would probably rub off on the kids as well, because a lot of the time the kids will be influenced a lot by what their parents say. And if their parents are being, you know, transphobic in any way, shape or form, then it's likely that that's going to rub off on the kid as well. Mm. And it it, it is something that I think, you know, if I ever move on from the school I'm currently at, that that might be a hurdle I have to face with the whole, you know, because I wouldn't want to work at a school that wouldn't want me to be mixed and gender non openly gender non-binary. Mm-hmm. But also, if I do want to get a, you know move somewhere new, then I don't want to be that limited on my options, and so it it does worry me sometimes. But I think it's important to still be open about it. Totally, you can only take it as it comes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, looking at groups of people like your students and that age group and stuff, how do you see the subject of gender? And how it shows up for them, obviously, very different generation, very different approach. And you said you you yourself are inspired to embrace who you are more openly because of a young person coming out to you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think the younger generation, the generation that are, you know, going for education at the minute, are a fantastic generation of young people who generally on the whole are extremely you know accepting of all gender identities and that yes they may not understand it all the time but actually Mm. we are seeing more people breaking down that binary and you know refusing to conform to it and also refusing to accept that that is you know the only case even if they don't identify as gender non-conforming which i think is it is really amazing to see and I think they're a lot more opening and accepting Mm -hmm. which my generation I would say are still on the whole relatively accepting there's only a few of the much older generations where they do struggle Mm -hmm. and even then it does seem to be a bit more in the minority but the young people nowadays typically the only ones who have issues it's again linking back to the parents it'll be their parents use that they regurgitate And if you sit down and have that conversation with them, they go, you've changed my mind completely. 
and yeah the the young people that i know and i work with are fantastic and Mm -hmm. are so accepting and they're thinking in ways that we should be thinking about how to break down all these different barriers and what society tells us we need to do and how we need to conform yeah absolutely that's good to hear really so you will have probably a really i don't know a good group of they they sound like they make either great allies or would be like just non-conforming really mm. in various ways which yeah. is great <laughs> yeah is there anything else you'd like to mention that we haven't talked about yet no i think i i think i've covered most of yeah the bases with sort of the education mm. aspect of it is an important aspect for me you know in the subject area i teach obviously being geography sometimes I have to have those conversations when you know, we teach about Uganda a lot in my school. And mm. so I have to have those conversations with students when they go, well, what's LGBT rights in Uganda? I'm like, appalling. They have no rights at all. And it's actually interesting because then, you know, I talk about the issues. It goes back to even colonialism and that, mm. that you know, the roots of colonialism, that the scars of colonialism, probably is better to say, has mm-hmm. left behind those massive issues of you know human rights and LGBT rights issues in lots of former colonies around the world, mm-hmm. and you know it's as even though these are young people, it's not it's important to still be very straight to them and say a bit of a pun uh, irony there. <laughs> um, but the only you know, good reason to be straight, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the only good time to be straight is in that way, yeah. But it's you know you just say to them. Even though I love this subject, but there are issues with it, you know, and mm. it's not perfect and we need to talk. Yes, we need to talk about these countries, but we also need to remember that in these countries, you know, I wouldn't be allowed to do my job doing mm-hmm. what I do. And and having those honest conversations with the students about a lot of the issues that are in the world is is important. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's good that you can kind of weave the subject of identity in with your teaching subject in that way, really. Yeah. How about your family or relationships or anything like that? Family is mm-hmm. family's complicated. I have told my family, but me and my family, we don't discuss these things. Like we love each other, but they're aware that I don't identify as, you know, male and I identify as non-binary. They don't understand it, but they love me for who I am. They're proud of me for what I do. So it is it is interesting. You know, I was, I was talking to my uh, mum about sort of doing the podcast and, you know, having these conversations around gender identity. And mm-hmm. my mum sort of just went, well, why are you doing that? You know, what makes you an expert? And I'm like, have told you this before um (laughs) and she just sort of goes oh yeah no i I remember now and then she'll just change the conversation but it was even the same you know when i I, when i came out as gay back you know i came out quite young i came out at 14 Mm -hmm. um you know i was in the middle of secondary school and so when that happened you know it was all oh well it'll just be a phase or oh well you know just you know keep it to yourself and you know whereas Mm -hmm. you know obviously I ignored all that completely, um, and I went, <laughs> you know, out and out and proud, white wearing rainbows at sixth form. We did a fancy dress day, and I went as a one person gay pride parade um, because, <laughs> and I went to a religious sixth form as well. I went to a Church of England and Catholic sixth form, so I sort of did it as a wow. as a bit of a I'm I'm here, I'm queer, deal with it. And so, Good yeah, for it's for my yeah. family. It's you know, it's just not something we really talk about. But I know they love me. Mm. And they're proud of me for whatever I do. And, Mm. you know, they'll always love and support me. They just don't always get it. And I will continue to try and educate them. And one day it Mm. might, the light bulb might switch on. Who knows? Yeah. 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 So you mentioned about identifying as gay. So do you, do you still resonate with that label? Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, actually, over the past week, sort of my pride group's been started up again. And I had a kid ask me, so you identify as gender non-binary, but what's your sexuality? And they went, well, I'm gay. And they went, but how does that work? Do you want to, mm. Are you only attracted to non-binary people? And I was like, no, I'm attracted to men. And they went, but gay is about, you know, men being interested in other men. And I went, 
you're right. It doesn't always fit when you think of it in terms of that. And it actually made me sit down and think because I'm like, I have an attraction to male people. Mm-hmm. Now that's not to say I would never fall in, you know, in love with someone of the opposite gender or someone who is non-gender conforming. Mm-hmm. But in my mind, my sexuality has always been in that way. And so for the first time, I'm actually having to think about what is my actual sexual identity, you know, and I probably still do identify as gay because my whole adult life, I've, whenever I've dated, it's always been with male presenting people. And Mm -hmm. I think it's just using that terminology of it's, I'm interested in male presenting people. Mm-hmm. And not to say necessarily masculine people, but I would date someone who is, I would date a trans man more than mm-hmm. happily. Um, as long as I'm attracted to them and they're a nice person, that's all I really look for. Mm-hmm. I'm not bothered about parts that are on someone's body. As long as, you know, we have stuff in common, we get along. They like to, you know, we like to go and do the same things and we have similar hobbies and that's mm-hmm. important. But it is, it's, again, it's that, the vocabulary of it all it's mm. and the language of it all is really interesting because it does make you think about the terminology that you're using totally yeah yeah i liked what you just said as well about being attracted to male presenting people but not necessarily masculinity yeah was that what you said yeah 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 it's interesting how you sort of separate the two i guess because i think for a lot of people it would be like well what's the difference you know yeah and you know especially within the lgbt community there's a lot of discourse about you know when people say you know mask for mask and stuff like that and you know you've got straight acting as labels that a lot of people like to have and it's like it's almost a bit like internalized homophobia sometimes Mm. where people Mm -hmm. they want to be in these relationships with other men but they still want to almost try and conform to what society expects. So they, it's almost mm-hmm. like they try and punish people who are effeminate and, you know, act in a more feminine way. And I, it's just something that I've never understood personally because I, yeah, I have types of people who I'm, who I'm attracted to. I like someone taller than me, but it's, I would never, you know, look at someone and go, well, they're to this you know, for me, I would never look at someone who's shorter and go, well, I would never be attracted to them because they're shorter than me. I would go, well, mm-hmm. if they're a nice person, and if I'm attracted to them, then so be it. Just because I've always mm-hmm. dated people who are taller than me doesn't mean it's what my, the be all and end all is. It's, it's yeah, just, absolutely. it's those interesting conversations in the queer community that, you know, have been happening more and more, but we still need to continue having. Mm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I guess it's just about having, you can have a type that you're attracted to, but that doesn't mean you'll, No, it, it has to always tick all those boxes, right? Exactly, yeah. Some will be non-negotiable and some will be negotiable, I guess. Yeah, they? like, you know, non-negotiable is, you know, if you're a horrible person, then I'm not going to want to be with you, which is what everyone almost looks for, I think. But, yeah, you know, I'm, so. I'm never going to look at someone and look at their physical appearance and judge them straight away. And I, I would mm. like, I like to get to know people first and... I think that's, you know, an issue that has always happened, really, probably in the community. But people are having more and more conversations about it now. And it is almost like trying to break down the barriers. And actually, one thing I've seen, especially in a lot of younger people, Mm -hmm. is that when I do my pride group, there are so many people who identify as pansexual Mm -hmm. because they just they don't care about the you know the gender binary and they don't care about who it is they just want to fall in love with someone because of who they are not what they are or what society says they are and Mm -hmm. i think again that's a testament to the younger people in our world is that it's part of the idea that they are wanting to break down the binary that has been instilled upon us all Mm. yeah well here's to breaking down the binary what we what we got to do Raise an imaginary glass, a cup of tea. <laughs> it's a school night, so yeah, definitely a cup of tea. Or something. Cup of tea, cup of tea. <laughs> oh, lovely. Oh, thanks so much for talking to me about all this, Jacob. It's been an absolute pleasure.
You can find out more details on the website at 50shadesofgender.com forward slash Jacob, where you can also read the transcript. And you can find Jacob on Twitter at mxprofit underscore geog, which is profit with a double T. There's a link on the episode page. Thank you for listening to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. You can find us online at 50shadesofgender.com, on social media and on YouTube. Again, if you'd like to support us, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. We hope you will listen again. Until then, stay curious and open minded. Yeah. So what made you want to come on the pod? I just think it's, you know, it's a really amazing thing to have, be able to talk about. Um, I love talking about like gender identity anyway. Mm. And I think my role that I've got like sort of in education as well, it's not a massively common role to have, you know, openly mm-hmm. non-binary or gender queer, gender fluid teachers. And so mm-hmm. I think it is, it's nice to have these conversations because I talk about it a lot in school, but it's nice to actually maybe have that wider conversation as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I just, I like, I like talking anyway. I'm quite well known for being able to talk. So <laughs> it's yeah. nice to, to do something a little bit different and have a chat with someone new as well.